Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Walton Library. I'm Michael Bellicosa. I'm the head of adult programming here at the library, and it's our pleasure to kick off this year's scholarly lecture series, which we offer each year with the Historical Society. And in fact, this is the 17th year we're doing this. 17. A couple of logistical notes. Uh, please turn off your phones and devices as we start the program. Uh, we're recording this, so we want to get a good recording. And many of you, of you are already signed up for all three uh, lectures in the series, but for those of you who have not done that yet, just remember that you have to sign up for each one separately. Uh, before turning over the podium for our introduction, I'd like to thank our planning committee for helping to put this series together. And we're all here today. And a special thank you to this year's series sponsor, Lorene Modi. And of course, many thanks to our partner, the Wilton Historical Society. Uh, finally, after the Q&A segment, we'll be having a reception at the back of the room where we can chat with the speaker and with each other while having some refreshments. And with that, please join me in welcoming Nick Foster, Executive Director of the Wilton Historical Society, who will introduce our speaker and then moderate the Q&A after the talk. Nick. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for braving the weather and being out here on this uh, Sunday afternoon and to kick off this the, the first lecture in this series. And we're so excited to be partnering with the library again for what is always a, a, a great series of events. Um, I will say, we you may have noticed this year, we're having three lectures instead of um, four or five. Um, we are slightly tweaking the, the series of events this year. We'll actually be hosting a panel discussion um, sometime in April at the Historical Society. So rather than a lecture, do more of a discussion style event, um, focusing on some of the, the uh, topics of conversation we'll be covering in, in this uh, lecture series this year. Um, and we'll be using that to open up an exhibit, uh, a new exhibit at the Wilton Historical Society called Wilton Works. Um, and we'll have more information about that uh, exhibit and that uh, panel as we get closer to April. Um, but so something to look forward to. But for today, um, it is my great honor to um, introduce Dr. Jamie Eaves. Um, Jamie is a, a colleague of mine in the museum field that I've worked with on a few different projects and as part of the Connecticut League of Museums board. Um, and he was very enthusiastically agreed to be part of this lecture when I reached out to him as a um, an expert in um, all sorts of things across the, the museum field, but particularly the topic we'll be looking at today, which is um, 18th and 19th century uh, Connecticut and technology. Um, uh, Jamie is the Mill Museum in Wyndham, Connecticut's uh, senior curator and also the uh, town historian of Wyndham, Connecticut. He earned a PhD in American history at the University of Connecticut, and he wrote his doc doctoral dissertation, Valley White with Mist, which examines the re relationships between people and the environment in the P Piscataquis River Valley in Northern Maine. He has an MA and BA in history from the University of Maine and is the executive director emeritus of the Mill Museum, having served in that capacity from 2011 to 2021. Um, Jamie has also been teaching history at the university level for more than 25 years with research specialties in 18th, 19th, and 20th century American environmental and industrial history, um, as well as the history of New England and public history. So um, without further ado, Jamie, please. Thank you, Nick. So you, you can see the title uh, of the presentation behind you, down, down Sodom. So I want to tell you, first of all, before we start what that means. Uh, so when I, I moved to Willimantic uh, in 1988 to uh, attend uh, University of Connecticut, uh, old timers in Willimantic told me that there was this neighborhood in Willimantic that one should be careful going to because they had been told by their parents when they were little, don't go down Sodom. And uh, it, it's the neighborhood surrounding some of the old mill buildings. Uh, in Willamette, it's a working class neighborhood. It still is and always has been since it actually was created as a, a neighborhood. So I asked them, like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean, Sodom? And, and they said, well, there's bars down there. <laughs> and, and well, there were, but fewer than in other parts of Willimantic. So I knew that couldn't be. So I started to, to dig a little more, and I talked to some people who knew about local history, and they told me, oh, it's because the Irish lived there. 
they said. Uh, including people who were Irish told me this. And, and, they said, and they didn't blame the Irish. They said, it's, you know, the Yankees were not nice to the Irish when they came, which I'm sure is not a surprise to anybody in this audience to hear that. Uh, and they, they figured, you know, those Irish Catholics were up to no good down there and probably getting drunk all the time. And so they, they called this neighborhood Sodom. So I wondered about, I researched it further, and actually the name goes before there was Irish migration to Willimantic. It goes back to the 1820s. The Irish show up at the very end of the 1840s. So it, what it was is working class people moved there into what had been a completely agricultural, farming, rural community, and now there's those factories and those factory workers, and they don't own property, so how could they possibly have the, the reason to vote on anything? And they must all be drunks. And, and so very early on, it was called, called, they called it Sodom, and down Sodom, just it was downhill from the rest of Willimantic, so like, you know, you went down Sodom. And there are a whole bunch of neighborhoods in Connecticut called Sodom. There are several of them that are scattered around. And when I started researching, the vast majority of them were once working class neighborhoods. And it tells us a couple of things. It tells us what, uh, what Yankees were thinking when people that seemed odd and that they maybe didn't like were moving into their community. And it also tells us how the new people who moved into the community were being treated. Uh, and, and so that leads me into what I, I was told that I should be speaking about is the social impact of industrialization and how industrialization, early industrialization in Connecticut, uh, affected people's people's lives. Because I'll move the slide forward, and I'm going to be turning on. Okay, this is not supposed to be doing this. Go away. I know you can't read it. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it says in a minute. I'm trying to get a timer up now. Don't want to go on too long. There we go. Start. So uh, industrialization, um, and I want to talk about that in Connecticut, and I want to talk about how it affected uh, affected people uh, and, and their lives, and. Um, um, I'm going to be talking mostly about the eastern and central parts of Connecticut uh, because that's what I know the most about. And that was where the textile industry came in. And here in the western part of Connecticut, textiles were a whole lot less important in the Industrial Revolution, and precision machinery was a whole lot more important, and probably you already know that. Um, but I'm going to tell you about the part of the state that I come from, with a lot of examples from, uh, from the Willimantic Wyndham area. Uh, so mo mostly this is pictures, and so I want to start, start with these. Uh, and the reason why industrialization located in the places it located, reason why it located in Wind, reason why down Sodom was where it was uh, in Willimantic, Willimantic part of the town of Wyndham, uh, is because there was water power, and water power was uh, the technology of the late uh, late 1700s uh, and early 1800s, and potential water power abounded in Connecticut's uh, many small rivers. So there are lots of, lots of small rivers in Connecticut. The Connecticut River itself was actually too big. They didn't have the technology to dam it. But what creates the water power is the drop. Uh, it's how, it's gravity. It's how much the water actually falls. Uh, and, and so the Connecticut River uh, descends about 90 feet from the, uh, uh, from the Massachusetts border all the way to Long Island Sound. And that's not a big drop per mile. Whereas a lot of the smaller rivers uh, we'll have drops like that in much shorter periods of time. The Willimantic River, which is barely a river, drops 90 feet in about a mile. And so you, that's the water power. And that's where the factories were located. It's where the, where the waterfalls, uh, uh, where the waterfalls were. Government plays a role as well. Uh, and so uh, industrialization in the United States was stimulated by government action. I, I spent a lot of time on this when I'm talking to my uh, to my students at the University of Connecticut, uh, and we, we talk about Hamilton's program to encourage industrialization. Uh, but I just wanted to mention, this isn't something that happens spontaneously. Industrialization occurred right after the American Revolution. Occasionally, they let me teach world history, which is exciting when they do. Uh, and when I teach world history, we look at when other countries in the world begin to industrialize, and amazingly, it's right after they become independent. So once countries are independent and a mother country is, is not preventing that from happening, 
what happens is those countries want to industrialize, and, and so it's government-led industrialization. The, the only place it wasn't was Great Britain, which is the first country to industrialize. So that had to happen by accident, because like nobody knew what was going on. Uh, but you know, since then, it, it's all been organized, uh, organized by government. Uh, there's a technology that's important. Uh, and the first element of industrial technology to get here in New England, and Southern New England was called the cockpit of the American Industrial Revolution. Southern New England means Rhode Island, which is actually where it starts, Connecticut and Massachusetts and Southern New Hampshire. It really spreads from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, out in all directions. Uh, and, and what we get first are carding mills. And, and if you've been to Old Sturbridge Village, you've seen one. They've got a carding mill up there. So a carding mill has a carding machine, and a carding machine, uh, actually, you feed the fibers in one end. Wool is what it was originally. Later on, it would be cotton. You feed it in at one end, and what it does is it just, it, it, uh, uh, it brushes the wool to get all of the fibers the, the, facing the same direction, uh, or brushes the cotton to get all the fibers facing the same direction to get it ready for spinning into, into thread. This was done traditionally with two handheld brushes, they were like wire brushes like you brush a cat with, and you know, you brush together like that. Uh, but then they invent these machines. The uh, top picture is actually a, a reconstruction of an early British uh, rotary carter uh, that was hand powered. The middle one, that's Sturbridge, that's their carding machine. Uh, and so what happens is by 1811, almost every town in Connecticut had a small carding mill. And what would happen is the farmers who had sheep would bring their wool uh, to the carding mill, and they would pay a percentage of the wool. they turn over a percentage of their wool to the miller, who kept it, that was the pay, and then you could go home with carded wool and then turn it over to your wife and daughter and try to persuade them that it would be a lot of fun to spin thread. Uh, there may be some arguments about that at home, but it was useful to be able to spin thread. Carding machines are followed by spinning frames, uh, and this is an early spinning frame. The spinning jenny was the earliest one, and that's in Britain. Uh, but th these are more typical. Uh, the photographs I'm showing you are towards the end of the early industrial period, because that's when photographs were taken. So this one was taken around 1900. Uh, but you know, if we looked at this stuff in the middle of the 1800s, they would look pretty much the same. There wasn't a lot of change uh, in the design, except that the mule spinners are replaced by ring spinners. Now, there's no people working in this picture, which is really too bad. But you can imagine working in a room full of these machines like that. Your job is to inspect every one of those feeds along that entire row that you see stretching before you. So you walk back and forth and back and forth. And if a thread breaks, you shut down that feed and then you tie the thread together and then you get it going again. Uh, and when the bobbin is full, you stop that feed and hand the bobbin to the bobbin boy or bobbin girl to carry on to the next, uh, next location. This one is a picture that has lots of people on it. These are looms, um, and this would have been taken towards the end of the 1800s, and we know that it has to be after 1879 because there's electric lights hanging from the ceiling, but we know it's almost certainly before 1900 because of the technology used in making the photograph. It has that sepia color to it, that tan color uh, that identifies uh, late, uh, late 19th century photography. So I like to show this one uh, to, to students and say, look how crowded that room is. Imagine working in that room. Imagine if you're like me and your eyesight is starting to go and you've got to like step back to look at what you're doing and you're stepping right into a machine if you do that. How easy it would be to brush into one of the other looms. And there's no housing over those looms. There's no covering to them. Uh, and, and so they grab things. So what a loom does, a loom weaves, uh, it weaves threads into cloth, uh, but it's got devices on it, rollers with teeth, and the job of those rollers with teeth is to pull the finished woven cloth uh, forward. So its job is to grab cloth and pull it. Cloth like your skirt, cloth like the sleeve of your blouse, or your hair. So I, I ask students, do you see any woman in that picture whose, whose hair is not tied up? No, I mean, they're not, these are smart people. Their hair is tied up so they won't get it caught uh, in the machine. Most of the women, sleeves are up like this. No middle class woman in the 1800s would be showing that much skin. That would have been considered improper, but like 
better to be improper than get your, your blouse caught into uh, in the, the machine. We don't get to see uh, their skirts, but other photographs that uh, the Mill Museum has uh, indicate that their skirts did not go all the way down to their shoe tops, as middle class women's skirts would have done at the same period of time. They're higher. There's oil all over the floor. They oiled those machines regularly. Your skirts would drag in the oil. Uh, and the, again, it's just the more flowing your skirt, the better the chances it's going to get caught. Better to have actually it's called a smocks that go over your clothing. They protect them, but you could also get out of them in a hurry uh, if you're grabbed by the machine. It doesn't show it here, but how you turn the machine off, there would be a rope hanging from the ceiling because that's where the power train was. The pulleys are all on the ceiling uh, and the leather belts come down from the ceiling. So you grab the, the rope and you pull it. And what it does is it lifts the, the leather belt off a live pulley and drops it onto a dead pulley, and slowly the machine comes to a halt. Very slow. By the time it does, you're, 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 you're well caught in it. And if you really are caught in it, you maybe can't reach that, that rope. Periodically, the women who worked in the weaving rooms, and the weavers were mostly women, would stand up from their machines, look around to make sure everybody's OK, and then go back to their, their machine. They're trying to look out for each other because of the dangers that would be, uh, be involved. Now, more pictures of looms that are here uh, and the kinds of things. And I just, these, these are here so you'll see they're not covered by anything, these looms. You're going to get a recording of this, so you can go through and read all of these details, and I know you will want to later on. Uh, there's a little history of how we, we of power looms that's there. So if we're talking about how industrialization changed lives, one of the good places to start is, is with migration. And I already alluded uh, to that. The textile mills sprang up along the rivers of Connecticut. And as they did so, uh, hundreds and thousands of workers, men, women, even children, arrived to labor in them. Some of them came from foreign shores, while others were native born, but all were migrants responding to a combination of push and pull, pushed out of their old homes by economic decline, overcrowding, and crop failures. They're mostly, they're, they're mostly the kids of farmers who show up to work uh, in, in these mills. And, and uh, you know, the farms were not doing well. Even by the early 1800s, farming in Connecticut was in a state of decline. There were too many people and not enough farmland. A lot of people went west to live in Ohio. Other people went to work in the factories. Or you sent your kids, and the kids then would send money back to help mom and dad pay their taxes uh, on their farm. Uh, and, and so they're moving into these places, pulled to the mill towns by jobs and the promise uh, of better lives. The first immigrants came to work, who came to work in the Connecticut mill towns were native-born rural Yankees. So to illustrate that, I put a congregational church. So that would be the Yankees, right? That's the Willimantic Congregational Church that, that is there. Uh, so those are the first people uh, who, who come on in. And so this is really late 1700s, all the way up until the very end of the 1840s, uh, when the Irish potato famine starts. It's really in the 1850s we start to get migration uh, from elsewhere. So at first, these are just rural Yankees that are moving on in. Another group brought in in the early days, not in large numbers, were from England and Scotland, and these were trained engineers. So I put the Episcopal Church in here. I, they founded it, these guys. Uh, so that, that's our version of the Anglican Church. Uh, and and so it's a smaller church than the Congregational Church in Willimani. Uh, and so they, they, and, but these were often, these are foremen, these are engineers. They're the more highly trained people for a while, uh, would be English or Scottish. And they, they learned all of this in the English and Scottish Industrial Revolutions, which, which had happened first. The Irish will arrive in the 1850s. So this is Willimani's oldest Roman Catholic church. This is St. Joseph Church. Uh, which they built themselves, even though they didn't have a whole lot of money. You know, they, they raised the money, they built this. They had a temporary church. They, uh, the Methodists got a new church, so they bought the old Methodist church, picked it up and carried it to where they wanted it to be. And it sat on a site until they were able to build. This is a gorgeous cathedral that they built, uh, a, a brick cathedral. And it, was, it was the Irish Catholic church uh, that was, was in, and it, it still is, uh, still is today. 
By the end of the century, French Canadians began to arrive uh, in Willimantic. And, and there's two stories. If you talk to people of French Canadian descent, they say, you know, my ancestors came here and the Irish were mean to them and told them to go away and not come to the church. So we went and built our own, that's St. Mary's. If you talk to descendants of the Irish, they oh, stuck up French Canadians, wouldn't even join us in our church. And, and so you get different stories. When the Poles arrived, by the way, they were welcomed to St. Joseph's Church. I, I don't know why they were, and the French Canadians were not, but there, 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 there were issues between the two groups. And so we have a St. Joseph's Church and a St. Mary's Church half a block apart from each other, and we pretend that the diocese line, like the parish line, goes right in between, but it doesn't really. Um, and uh, we actually have three Roman Catholic churches in Willimantic now because we have Sagrado Corazon, uh, which is Latino, which is a more recent church that was built after the Industrial, uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, though when a few years ago, there was an awful fire in St. Mary's, a horrible fire. It mm -hmm. almost destroyed the entire, this church that we're looking at here. And when that happened, uh, the, the uh, parishioners at St. Joseph's welcomed the parishioners at St. Mary's, uh, and they, they all got along very well with each other. Uh, you know, for a while until the St. St. Mary's could be rebuilt. That may sound like it might be unique to Willimantic, but the town of Old Town, Maine, where I grew up, had a St. Joseph and a St. Mary's church, and the St. Joseph was Irish, and the St. Mary's was French-Canadian, and instead of being half a block apart, they had one house in between them. Uh, so, and... Uh, so with, we get more than one, but it also shows us the size of those migrations uh, as Willimantic would have gone from being a majority Protestant community to a majority Catholic community. That might not sound like a big idea to us today, because uh, we tend to be more tolerant of such things, uh, but it was in Connecticut in the middle of the 1800s, this was a big deal. The 1850s was the decade of the Know Nothing Party, the, the anti-immigrant party in Connecticut that actually seized the majority in the Connecticut legislature and won the governorship briefly in the middle of the 1850s. Uh, and uh, one of their key issues was to keep immigrants out, especially Catholic immigrants. They didn't trust them. They, they believed that Catholics shouldn't be allowed to vote because they just took orders from the Pope and didn't think on their own. I have seen so, so many of my Catholic friends argue with their priests that I know that can't possibly be true. <laughs> this is a letter that we have in the museum's collection in French uh, of somebody looking for a job. It is not very grammatically correct French. The uh, uh, person who wrote it was working class, probably only had uh, the equivalent of an elementary school, school education. Uh, and I do have uh, somebody who can help me translate these. I can translate grammatically correct French, but I get bollocked up on the uh, stuff with a bad grammar. Uh, so uh, uh, our volunteer will do this. She says, it's just like getting a letter from my brother, she says. Uh, so she, she translates them for us. Immigration brought other groups as well. Uh, and, and so looking at the many churches of Willimantic gives us a real clue as to all the different groups that arrive. And, and so the three that, that show up here, I mean, one of them is obviously is the synagogue uh, that is there. Uh, there there's also uh, a Ukrainian Catholic church, which is not Roman Catholic. Uh, it's separate, uh, although most of its parishioners are Serbian and Croatian descent who live in town, not Ukrainian, but we do have Ukrainians that live in town. Uh, and the Ukrainian flag has been flying from various places in Willimantic over the last couple of years. The white church that's there uh, is the uh, Swedish Lutheran church. And I, I went actually out to photograph these things one, one very cold winter day because it was a really bright sun uh, and I got really good pictures. And I'm, photogra and I'm photographing uh, the, the Lutheran church and, and the, uh, the minister was inside and saw me outside taking pictures and wondered what I could be up to. Uh, so he, he comes out to find out, and I told him, uh, that I, I'm making posters that would show the ethnic diversity of the community through the different churches. So he invited me in. They have photographs of every one of uh, their, their, their ministers going back to the uh, original ones in the late 1800s. And even though they're black and white photographs, you look at them and go, yeah, that, that guy was Swedish. Uh, <laughs> you could just tell. That's uh, Sagrado Corazon at, at the top. It's meant to look Mexican. Uh, and some of its parishioners are Mexican-American, and some of them are Puerto Ricanos, uh, but, but that's there as well. And, you know, and then there's the, you know, the Latvian Lutheran Church, which, alas, has since closed down due to lack of uh, membership. 
uh, since I took that, that picture. So migration is something that really shows up with lots of different people coming so that by the time we get to the beginning of the 20th century uh, in, in Willimantic, you know, had about a third of the population of Willimantic, not the town of Wyndham, but Willimantic, the industrial part, about a third of the population was foreign born. If we throw in their native born children, it's over half the population. Uh, so it really, it, it brings about uh, real change. And one of them is the introduction of multiple churches to the community that are, are still there. So gender, uh, age uh, are also important things uh, to be thinking about when we're thinking about the lives of, of mill workers. Uh, this is a quote from one of our uh, oral history interviews. My whole family worked at American Threat, as a matter of fact. My mother worked in mill number four in the card room. That would have been a post-World War II thing. Before that, they thought it was too dangerous for women to work in the carding machines. Those are those big ones with the big drums like that I showed you. And if you're not careful, uh, they will grab hands, fingers. They pull off fingers. They pull off hands. They pull off arms. People lost limbs in those, uh, in those machines. So they said, no, nah, that's too dangerous for women until World War II when they, they needed labor. So they decided it wasn't too dangerous for women after all. Uh, they didn't change the machines any. They opened them on up. Uh, so she said, my, my, my mother worked in mill number four in the carding room. My brother worked there too uh, in the warehouse. Uh, and my sister worked in the yarn twisting department. One of the clues that is in here is that different jobs were given to different genders. There was women's work and there was men's work. So in the late 1700s, in the early 1800s, when these mills are being created, the gender division of labor was a common thing. It was traditional in, in the country. Uh, for among farming families, there was women's work and there's men's work. Every now and then, one of my sister uh, students makes a mistake uh, and, and says that with the Industrial Revolution, women began to work. And so I have to tell them, women have always worked. What happened is they now got paid for it. Uh, farm wives worked really hard. Uh, they just didn't get paid anything for the work that they, they did. Um, so gender divisions of labor. So the spinning and the weaving was usually given to women. It was usually considered women's work. And so women were the spinners and the weavers. Men worked in the carding rooms, uh, at least early on. Uh, they worked in the warehouses. They carried heavy things. Men were the fixers. They would not, you had to apprentice to learn how to fix the machinery and they would not let the girls apprentice. So there's no way that you could learn. That's the, uh, an early glass ceiling. You can't get promoted if you can't learn uh, the skill. And if you, the only way you can learn the skill is apprentice and they won't let you apprentice, well, you're not going to learn. So men were the fixers who were much better paid. Uh, and they were the foremen. Uh, and they were the managers. Uh, so there, you know, there was men's work and there was women's work. The majority of the workers in the textile factories were women. That is not true of the precision machine or metal industry. The majority of the workers in those factories uh, would have been men. So some pictures uh, of people who were then called mill girls. You were called a mill girl. Depend it didn't matter your age. If you were female, you were a mill girl. Uh, it was the phrase that, that they used. I, I like that the picture of the two women... Um, uh, well dressed. Uh, they're holding in their hands flying shuttles, so they're weavers. Um, and this one is great because it shows their skirts don't go all the way down to the floor, right? And I like that no skin is showing. Those are long johns that she's got underneath and, and boots that they would wear as well. They're being very modest uh, in, in, in their dress. Uh, would be This is early in the 1800s. Then we got the picture from later uh, in the 1800s of the girl uh, working in the mill. Now the workers are much more likely to be children. They are paid less, well, less when you adjust for inflation. Uh, the, the working conditions got worse and pay got worse over the course of the 1800s. And the reason is, is the more potential workers you have, the less they were going to get paid. It was easy to fire people. But also they began to reconstruct the technology to make it simpler. They replaced the mule spinning frames which requires some skill, with ring spinning frames, which required less skill, also that they could lower wages. That was the whole idea. The way you were paid was piece rate. You were paid by how much product you made. That's how you were paid. Uh, and what they would do periodically is that they would, uh, they would lower the piece rate. Since you had to make the same amount of money each year in order to pay your bills and survive, if the piece rate goes down, you have to work harder. You have to work faster. You can't actually work more hours because the milk 
in, in the early days before the electric lights, it's open from sunrise to sunset. So I mean, that, that's it. But you work your shift. You're not, you're not able to work additional shifts. So you work faster. And what happens when workers work faster around dangerous machinery? They're more likely to get injured. And the injuries really began to pile up uh, by, the, by the end of the century. I wish we had a nice first-hand account written by a Connecticut mill worker, but we don't. There are two written by Massachusetts mill workers, and I always don't like going to Massachusetts for examples of things, and, and uh, but you have to. You know, I, I grew up in Maine, uh, Massachusetts. It's like, man. Um, so, it, it, but we do, and so these are these are the, these are great books. The best one is by Harriet Hanson Robinson. Robinson would be her married name. Uh, and she wrote a book called Lumen Spindle. She wrote it in an old age, and it's about what it was like to be a mill worker in Lowell, Massachusetts uh, in the early 1800s. There's also a biography of her written by the wonderful historian Claudia Bushman uh, that, that goes on with the rest of, of her life. And one of the things I do is, is I, with my students is I ask them to be able to compare and contrast the, the being a mill worker with being an enslaved woman in the South uh, at the same period of time. This is before the Civil War. And we, we have firsthand accounts, so the students get to read firsthand accounts of both of them. So, you know, it, it's most of them say they wouldn't want to be a mill worker. The pay was lousy, the hours were long, um, didn't get a huge amount of respect from society. Uh, there are all kinds of problems uh, with it. But then when, when I found out what it was like to be an enslaved woman in the South, they, they see the difference right away. Uh, so one of the things that Harriet Hanson Robinson you know, wrote about was that she got to go to school uh, until she decided to go to work in the mill, which is, I think, was 10 or 11 years old is when she did that. Uh, but she had to go to school before that, so she got an education. Uh, and so th that's, that's part of her story. Uh, she got to go to church if she wanted to. She was allowed to go to church or not go to church. It was her choice. Uh, and her choice, which church, she describes when she got mad at the minister and walked out of the church one day uh, and didn't go back for a while. Uh, she actually got the equivalent of a high school education because she only had to work six days a week, Monday through Saturday, uh, an average of 11 hours a day, uh, long working hours. I mean, we would blanch at that, but it gave her Sundays off. And she talked about how most of the mill workers went to church on Sunday morning uh, so that they could, after church, they, they could strut up and down Main Street with, with their boyfriends or girlfriends. Uh, that, that's what was dating. Uh, so they could do that. But she went to what she called Sabbath school, which was not religious education. It was essentially a high school education that was free that she could get Sunday afternoons. And so she got uh, a more advanced education. So she talks about those kinds of things. She also talks about there was really not a lot of sexual abuse in, in the mills, as there certainly was on the plantations uh, in the South. One of the things that uh, Robinson did, um, she was still named Hanson at the time, she's a teenager, is she joined with some other so-called mill girls in Lowell, and th they did something remarkable. They created the first ever, ever, ever in the entire history of human beings on this planet, the very first magazine written by, edited by, illustrated by, everything but printing it off on the printing press by women. They even sold the advertising copy for it. Uh, it's called The Lowell Offering. It's available online now if you want to read it. It's great reading. And as you, you might guess, these are teenagers. What did they write about? A lot of drama and angst they wrote about. Uh, but they also wrote about politics. They wrote about how women deserved greater rights. They wrote about how mill workers should be paid more and have better working conditions. And they wrote about, although they had never met an enslaved person in their life, they wrote about the injustice of slavery and how it should be ended in America and everywhere else in the world. So what happens with Harriet is that William Robinson, a little bit older than she was, and he was a, uh, a journalist and he wrote for an abolitionist newspaper and he got a copy of the Lowell Offering and he saw some stuff Harriet had written that was abolitionist and he said, oh man, I want to meet her. I think this is a hugely romantic story. He fell in love with her mind. I mean, to me, this is great. And so he went to meet her and they did fall in love and they got married. And uh, he died fairly young. It was after the Civil War. He made it through the Civil War. But she actually wrote with him. They actually, they wrote together under an assumed name because if you were an abolitionist writer before the Civil War, somebody's going to beat you up if they caught you. Uh, 
And, and so, and then when when he died, she had to raise the children by herself, uh, and she became a writer, and that's that's how she she did that. The the other person is Lucy Larkham, who never got married, but she also worked in the uh, uh, Lowell. She became a school teacher uh, later on. I don't think her book is quite as good, but you can read them. So, okay, more information on Harriet. So I gave you stuff here on Harriet so you can learn all about her uh, if you're interested. So what happens is what historians call feminization of the workplace, uh, that uh, women began to be a larger and larger percentage of wage workers uh, in, in America and in Connecticut. Uh, and so I, I looked up some statistics uh, for this by, by year, both for the United States and for Connecticut. So in 1870, women made up uh, a little less than 15% of the paid workforce in the U.S. and almost 18% in Connecticut. Connecticut's more industrialized, so the percentage is, is larger. And they both keep going up. And I took it up to, through 1950, uh, where in the U.S. women were 27.4%. Uh, of the wage force uh, and, and in Connecticut, the U.S. as a whole in Connecticut, it's 31.5%. And as you know, that's just gone up ever since then. So industrialization, one of the real impacts it has is it provides wages for women, and eventually women will be able to control those wages and make their own decisions about what they're going to buy. And think of how revolutionary all of that was uh, in American history. A uh, photograph that I, I like showing uh, to the students, this is... Uh, Workers posing. It, pictures of the workers indoors in the 1800s are rare uh, because it's hard to get enough light. Notice how they were in an upper floor with big skylights above to be able to take that because uh, even though there's some electric lights that show in here, that wouldn't have been enough light to be able to develop a photograph uh, in, in the 19th century. These are workers. I, I blew up the picture a bit and, and they're holding, some of the women are holding uh, shuttles in their lap, so they're weavers, so that you can tell it. But there are men in the background. So the women are in the front, the men are in the back, and they both would have, have worked in the mills in different rooms doing different, different tasks. And, and you can recognize who the boss is. He's the guy standing in the middle with the, with the, uh, the suit on. And, and I, I think he's a pig because he's got the young woman in front of him, sitting in front of him, and he's got his hands on her, hands on her shoulders, uh, and, and she's got this look on her face like, you know, and he's a pig. Uh, so I told you that sexual abuse might be less than for slave women in the South, but th there's some of it going on. Uh, power relationships were power relationships, and the women didn't have power, uh, the women who worked in the, in the mills. Uh, this is a, a mill that was in uh, Columbia, Connecticut, uh, and it shows, uh, it shows kids. It's a very early picture, and it's, it's a photograph of a photograph, uh, and whoever did the photograph of the photograph uh, somehow played around with it to make it look more, more gray scale. The original probably would have been a lot more amber in color when it was taken. So what was women's work? Women's work would have been working with big, heavy machines uh, like these. <coughs> Anybody know why you have two pictures like that side by side that are almost exactly the same? Stare optics, yeah. Um, my, I was talking about this with my students in UConn just this past week. They are fascinated by that idea, yeah. about how boring life must have been if that was your entertainment. Uh, it gives you a 3D look uh, for it. <coughs> this is the Cheney, Cheney Silk Mills in uh, Manchester. Uh, is what those would have been in the early 20th century. So uh, you get belt-driven machinery. You do have electric lights that you can see uh, in there, but you still have to have the big windows to add additional light uh, that would be there. So I mean, these are women working on heavy machines. Uh, these, these women get to sit down. Usually you don't, but the machinery they're working on allows you to sit down. This is the one I like really showing to, to my students because I tell them, that's you. That's you if you live back then. You're not in college. This is you. Because uh, that's about the age of a college student, uh, is the young woman here. And I love the look of concentration on her face. Tremendous mm -hmm. concentration. She's thinking. Because if she doesn't, she's going to get hurt. She has to pay attention. So don't let anybody tell you this is mindless work. It was not. You had to be thinking all the time, paying attention all the time. She's also got a smock that she's wearing to protect her, her clothing. Her hair is pinned up. And her sleeves are rolled up. And so it gives you all those, those kinds of lessons. This is, uh, this is a Willimantic one, uh, and this is a favorite of a friend of mine. She says, this is, this is, this is a typical picture. She says, women working, man watching. Uh, so the, the overseer is a man. He's just standing there watching them. Uh, and it's, again, belt-driven machinery uh, is what they're working on. 
Uh, and this is a winding machine, and this is more 20th century, and you can tell by her hairstyle. That's Irene Monroe, and we have an oral history interview with her. Back to the Cheney Mills, you can really see the hair pinned up. You can really see the smock that she's wearing. Uh, you have to develop heavy outer clothing. So what did the men wear so that they wouldn't get caught in the machines? Denim. Denim, bib overalls out of denim. Because uh, it, it meant that it's thick, and so it's not going to be as easily grabbed by the machinery. So you know, the denim industry is going to do really well because of, uh, of all of this. What are men doing? Carrying heavy stuff. And, and I think if that guy took off his shirt, he'd have a blue shirt underneath of the big S on it, I think. And that's Superman. Because I, I, we have one of those on a shelf that's a roll that's rolled up cotton being ready to be fed on into a carding machine uh, that's there and he's carrying it. The one we have on the shelf, if I tug as hard as I can, I can maybe move it an inch on the shelf. So he's carrying this thing. This, guy, this is one strong dude. And his name's on the back of the picture, which is really great. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. It's a long Polish name. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, tough guy. That would have been in the 1940s or 50s is the picture. Uh, this is actually blowing air through some of the, 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 the cotton before it's getting ready to be carded to try to blow out some of the dirt that's in it uh, so that you, you don't have that. This is how they dyed things early on. Big open vats. With, with dye in it. And then what you did is you took the already made skeins of yarn or, or thread and you put them in, stirred them around, and when you thought it was done, you hooked them out with a stick and you can't see from where you are, but in the background they're, they're like racks, wooden racks set up like you would dry clothes on. And it's, they're dry, dr drying there. By the time we get to the 20th century, this is how you dye. That's a pressure cooker. Uh, and so you actually have the thread, the white thread, uh, wound up on steel, uh, stainless steel spools, and it goes into that pressure cooker and under heat and, and pressure. That would have been an incredibly hot room to work in, by the way, the dye room. And I've interviewed guys that worked there. They were men who worked in the dye room. And some of them swear that it was so hot they worked in their underwear. And then others say, no, we didn't. We'd never do that. And I, I don't know who's telling me the truth, but I, I've heard both stories. And of course, once you move away from water power, which is 1870s and 1880s, they move to steam power, then you've got the steam boilers. These are called firemen who work in the steam, and that's even hotter uh, than working in the, in the dye shops. Some work is kind of fun, and so they had their own, uh, their own print shops, so that's a printer. And, and I, I give this one to my students and ask them, figure out the date of this, and they go on and on trying to figure it all out, and I tell them to look for the calendar that's hanging on the wall in the background. Um, but uh, you know they they printed their own stuff because it's cheaper that way. So there's lots of jobs. It's it's and some of the jobs require a lot of skill. I mean, being a printer means you have to be able to know grammar and spell and do, and do it all backwards. By the way, uh, so it required a lot of skill to be able to do some of those those sorts of things. There's a lot of science that's involved in the work as well. The fixers made their own toolboxes. This is one that we have, and we have a bunch of them because they didn't belong to the company. So when American Thread left Willimannic, they weren't taking these with them. They belonged to the workers who then donated them to the museum. When this is full of metal tools and metal pieces, it's really heavy. That's what apprentices are for, um, to carry those things around. Uh, but uh, you know they, they would have those. Again, that's highly skilled work, and again, it's work they wouldn't let women do. Uh, they also had uh, engineers, draftsmen, um, and would produce uh, thousands of, well, today we would call them blueprints, but they're written in ink on linen paper. Uh, they're technical engineering uh, diagrams. Some of them are the most beautiful things, like you did it with an extra sketch kind, not an extra sketch. What was it? Spirographs, like the spirographs we had when we were kids. They look like that, some of them. Just gorgeous drawings that they did. Wonderful technical art. Uh, that was there because when they bought a new machine, they had their engineers diagram every little piece in that machine. So if something broke, they made the replacement themselves. They didn't go to the manufacturer. They wanted to get it up and running as fast as they can. So they also had a machine shop where they made all the replacement parts and they wouldn't let the girls apprentice for that either. Foreman had nice desks to work on, maybe pretended they could type. Uh, so be things like that. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, the gender division of labor. So th this is, uh, this is a, in Willimannic, it's from the 1950s. 
It's the William Brand Company. Um, what they did is they made cables. Uh, they, they made metal cables. And the same technology for making steel cables uh, or any other metal that you want to use, you, it's the same that you would use making thread. It's the same basic idea. So they're located in Willimantic because they would find skilled workers who would know how to do this stuff, who would understand what they were doing, uh, and, and so did that. Um, and so th these are politicians and executives announcing the opening of the factory, and they're all men. Uh, that would be there. Any anybody know who the guy standing at the podium is? Ribikoff. Really good. I am super impressed. Uh, yeah, that's who that is. Uh, you know, other guys are, you know, executives of the, the brand company. The company has been bought and then rebought and then sold and then resold uh, and is now owned by an international conglomerate, but it's still in Willimantic. It, it makes like fiber optic, maybe not fiber optics anymore. We're not doing those. Whatever the modern cables are that we, we do. So after 1840, there are some changes. Women start to become carters. And so this is Alice Laferriere. Uh, she was from Quebec. Uh, and so she's, she gets to work on a carding machine, and she's happy about it, uh, as you can see. Uh, so you know, she, she's there. And uh, I like this one. This guy is uh, hes showing off his pipes, isn't he? You know, He got that shirt so that the women workers will all look at him. That's what he's doing. Uh, so he's there. We put this picture up, and somebody came by to, to see it. I know him. And so we, we got to identify who he was. Uh, that's The stuff he's got there is called sliver, and it's what comes out of the carding machine. He's, he is coiling it into a, a bucket. Um, and this guy, we also know who he is as well, uh, is, is working on machinery that's there. Gives us an idea of the, the what, what men wear. The older men were not like trying to look good at all. They just, you know, have T-shirts. Dungarees is what they would wear. The younger men might, you know, have the, the shorter sleeves. But by the 1950s, women are dressing up a little bit. Uh, unions have come in, wages have gone up a little bit, and uh, and and they're starting to dress up. So uh, you know, she's got lipstick on, uh, and she's got a watch. You know, she's you know she she's trying to show that she has she is successful in this world. She is working her way up. She's proud of that, and it's showing in her dress. Same is true with these two women. And the woman in the foreground, I got a chance to meet um, by totally by accident. Her daughter brought her to the Mill Museum in Willimantic. She's a very, very elderly woman when she arrived. And as they're coming in the door, the daughter is telling me, oh, my mom was to work here. She was, you know, when she was young. She, it's actually where she worked when she was right out of high school and had just gotten married. And, and uh, she says there. And, and so... Uh, <coughs> And the daughter says to them, hey, mom, maybe we'll see your picture in here somewhere. So it was hanging. Uh, and, and so the, she walks up to it, and she looks up at the picture, and she says, that's me, she says. So I got to have a nice interview with her, and she pointed to make sure that I saw she had a wedding band on in that picture. Uh, but she, had, uh, she has lipstick. Her hair is kind of styled. She actually had a little bit of lace on her blouse. So I asked her, did, did you know, they tell you you were going to take your pictures that day, and that's why you dressed up a little bit? She got super indignant with me, and she said, no, if you're a lady, you dress up when you go to work, she said to me. This sort of shows some change over time uh, that... You know, as wages were starting to go up after World War II and as unions started to come in and make it possible, these became more like middle class jobs than they had been before. And with new series of, of attitudes, they're boxing things up. This is a guy working at the cable company, by the way. This is, this is uh, um, that's a beautiful picture to me. I just, I love the, ge the geometry that's, that is in that. That's a winder. They're, they're twisting cables together. So the cables inside have several wires twisted together. That's just what a strand of thread does. Sewing machine thread is six ply. It's six strands of thread twisted together on a machine very, very much uh, like that. I'm going to skip a raven for right now. You had to have offices, so they hired office workers. They kept making the offices bigger. They never understood they were going to need more offices. So this is an early office worker. Uh, this picture was taken around 1895. Her name was Gertrude Crane. Uh, and so we're getting office workers as well. And that's about the time that women began to replace men as secretaries. It's the late 1800s. Uh, and so 
Uh, this is another kind of job that becomes available. And if we look at these old photographs where they march all of the workers into a room and line them all up and have their picture taken, you can start to pick out the office workers because they're dressed differently than the workers that are, that are on the floor. It's a hard life. The hours were long. This was the time clock. So this was made by uh, uh, the forerunner of IBM. IBM got started by making time clocks. And so this, is, uh, this was made in, I want to say Binghamton, but maybe not. It may be Endicott. One of the, one of the triple cities in New York is where that was made. Uh, so long, long hours. So, uh, early on, uh, sunrise to sunset. When, uh, when electric lights come in, uh, what happens is uh, uh, that uh, uh, they, they start to run two 11-hour shifts. Uh, but those are, those are long shifts. Uh, and it's not until 1912 that Massachusetts you know, reduces the, the, working, the, the, the work week from 60 hours to 54. And it's by law that it does that. Pay was, I don't know who this idiot is holding the slide here, sign here. But, um, but um, you know, that, that's what we're talking about. Uh, you know, for, for workers, you know, this is, it was low pay. Uh, you know, if we, we look at what a middle class uh, worker was making, it, it's, you know, four times as much uh, that are there. And so this gives us a little bit of an idea uh, of some of the factories in Connecticut and what the pay was like. They're not paying a lot, which is why dad goes to work, mom goes to work, kids go to work. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're leaving school in their teens to go to work because the family needs their education. They have some education, but they don't have a high school education. That was one of the real differences between working class person and a middle class person around 1900. You know, one would have a high school education and one, uh, one would not. Pay increased during the world wars uh, when there was a higher demand uh, for things, but then went down uh, after World War I was over with. Connecticut uh, finally passed laws, said, well, since the working conditions are dangerous, any factory that is over a certain size must have a nurse. So there, there's the nurse. This is obviously a posed photograph because the woman is smiling, who is having her hand bound up. And I'd be going, ow. Uh, but OK, you, you, get a, you get a nurse. But getting caught in machines is still a, still a danger. So there are a whole bunch of photographs that we, we have that are snapshots that are very clearly were designed to be before and after pictures. Worker doing right thing, worker doing wrong thing. What do you think? Is that the right thing or the wrong thing? Wrong thing. The machine is turned off to take the picture. But you know, as the, as the cotton came out of one end of the carding machine, it would sometimes jam up. And people would be tempted, because they're on piece rate. So they want to get working real fast, because they want to make sure they get paid. You think you can reach in there and unjam it? People do that with snowblowers, right? And same kind of results. You know, you're going to get badly hurt if something like that happens. Lots of machines hurt people. Uh, the the, the uh, looms, the, the shuttle goes through the loom at 60 miles an hour, and it's got a metal point on each end of it. And sometimes they would fly loose, and sometimes they would hit people at 60 miles an hour. So I told my students to try to get them to understand that. Ah, that would be, you know, you know, like your parents, the speed they would drive on the highway, and they all laughed at that. Like, my parents go faster than that. Uh, but you're going to get hurt. Brown lung is that there's cotton fibers or wool fibers all through the air, and you're breathing them in, and they uh, slice up the insides of your lungs. They, they cut you on the inside. And, you know, when it heals, um, you know, it, it heals the scar tissue, and you can't breathe through scar tissue. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, lot, lots, of, lots of issues. Uh, and so your, your, your life might not, might not be very long. So I, I was actually working with a group of uh, interns from Electric Boat last summer. And uh, so they had mentors who were older workers, and these are uh, high school seniors who were coming up, trying to decide whether that's the kind of work they wanted to do. They were learning to be electricians and things like that at Electric Boat. And, and you know, we were talking about uh, you know, the old days. And you know, one of the, one of the older mentors said, "Yeah, I, I remember. I went to work and was showed uh, that that man is a retirement plan. That's great. You know, there's a pension." And he said he got all excited about it until what happened is that um, the uh, one of the other workers said, "Oh, that's not for you. That's for your widow. Um, you know, you're not going to live long enough to get get that." So this the, this is the the the, uh, the spinning frames. That, that that's that's where you get the brown lung disease. These things just push off clouds of fibers into the air that you're going to breathe in. 
And this is just to remind you to use your safety goggles. And sometimes it's just uncomfortable, so that's an early humidifier. So you have to spin thread and wind thread in incredibly humid environments, or else if it dries out, it breaks. So they make it really humid, and the early humidifier is they would fill that bottom pan with water. You can see the pipe when they pipe it on in, and then the top one is a fan, and they blow the fan across the top of it. And I did an oral history interview with a woman who said, yep, I worked right next to one of those, and at the end of every day, my hair was dripping uh, from the humidity at the end of the day. So there are strikes that go on. Police sometimes get involved. This is a card that you would have to sign saying you knew a strike was going on. This is evidence that they went looking for strike breakers. The police tended to arrest the strikers more often than anybody else. Uh, workers lived in tenements. Uh, so there's row houses and there's boarding houses. And the boarding houses actually had pretty nice uh, living rooms. But that's, that's the live, decked out for a wedding uh, of one of the boarding houses. And that's the boarding house keeper. Her name was Mrs. Snow in the 19-teens. And this was a women's boarding house. And one of her job was to prevent the women from smuggling their boyfriends upstairs to where the rooms were. And I'm thinking she's really good at her job just by looking at her. <laughs> I wouldn't mess with her. She got paid a little more than all the other women did because she had to manage this boarding house. So like, she was, she's like a businesswoman. She had business skills. These are the row houses designed for families. That's a duplex. You've seen them all over the place. They have six rooms, three upstairs and three downstairs. Usually they were shared by two families. So we tend to think super, super crowded. Uh, there'd be 10 to 12 people per unit. Uh, and every room with the kitchen was turned into a bedroom. That's the most common thing. But th then we can look at New York City tenements and like, not crowded compared to those. Uh, so it's kind of in between. There are apartment houses as well. Old cities and villages grew up among the mills, and so an urbanization took place uh, that people weren't otherwise used to, uh, and rapid urban growth as a result. But there's also recreation. The mills build parks. Uh, this, this is a park where you can play baseball. In fact, they actually like to have different, different work rooms, have different teams to encourage them not to like each other and have competition among themselves. They're there playing. They also had dances as well as fundraisers uh, and things like that. So this, this picture is one I just go, you're a mill hand is what they said. So I put hands uh, that would be there and we've reached the end. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Jamie. That was fantastic. A uh, whole bunch of information in a very succinct uh, period of time. So thank you so much. So we're going to open up to the floor to questions, but I certainly, as, uh, as we talk through this and we think about the, the theme of, of this lecture series and thinking about technology, I mean, the, the mills were the computers, the technology of the period that affects, you know, sort of the social, economic, sort of everything in, in life um, for the people living in these communities. So thinking about sort of technology now and the resistance we sometimes see to it, where did, was there resistance that came into this where, you know, aside from objecting to the immigrants that came into the community, were, were there, you know, the, the more agrarian landowners saying like, don't build that factory in my town that has nothing to do with me. Did they sort of hate, you know, the new money factory owners? Like what was, what was the response to these, these technologies sort of changing the atmosphere of the community? All, all the things that you would, would, would expect new people coming into town that I don't like. Taxes are going to be going up as a result of that. I don't like the taxes that are going. Why is my farm taxed at the same rate for land per acre as a factory is being? That was a big issue that was, was there. So there's a lot of argument about taxes that would be there. And of course, the mills try to get out of paying taxes, which doesn't make them very well liked by the, the people in, in, in town. And then the mill builds, uh, builds a company store. And all the merchants say, no, no company store. No, that's competition. We don't want that. Uh, and, and so there'd be those things. But there's also resistance by the workers th themselves who are trying to get better working conditions and higher pay and more safety uh, and things like that. And some of those workers, like Harriet Hanson Robinson, will remember the work as being, I've interviewed people, oh yes, I had this wonderful time working at the mill, it was great, I had lots of friends. And so we, partway through the interview, I said, so you wanted your kids to work in the mill, right? Oh, no, they said. I wanted my kids to make something of themselves, and I wanted them to go to high school. I didn't want them to have to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> have to work in the mill. So, you know, there, there was lots of strikes uh, happened. Uh, 
So there is resistance on all sorts of, of levels and a lot of people who, who didn't. I mean, if you're going to name a neighborhood where the mills are located, Sodom, you, you know that, that people don't like this. This, is, this seems dangerous. It's challenging traditional, uh, traditional ways of life. And so the case, kind of resistance you would expect to have happen was happening. Questions from the floor? Yes, right in front. We know from uh, factories like these, uh, the number of fires that occurred, especially in New York, the, the big fire there that killed many women. And we understand the conditions, the environment that led to that. Is there data that's, that uh, shows how many, uh, or the extent to which we had injuries and possibly death um, in these factories? Thank you. Uh, so the question is, do we have data about the injuries and maybe even deaths in the factories? Deaths are not as much as you might think, uh, but the injuries were huge numbers. So th these actually by, the, uh, by a little before 1900 are being recorded by state law. And actually, any college or public college or university that has, is a repository of state, state documents will have copies of these. Uh, they're, so they're easy to find. They're probably available online now. I haven't looked. Uh, I, I live with Eastern Connecticut State University across the street, so I just go over and look them up there in the government documents room. Uh, but uh, they have numbers on all of these kinds of things. And that's why states began to demand nurses and they start to demand safety kinds of things. The unions also are demanding safety kinds of things as well. So one of, one of the things that came in by the early 1950s is a safety device put on the spinning frame so they no longer shoot out all of that, that fiber into the air. It's a vacuum that's built onto it and it sucks up about 90% of the fiber. It's not expensive to add it, but it wasn't gonna be added until people made it be added. So those things, uh, things are there. Um, the fires seem to have been more about damaging property than people in the factories, uh, probably because it's not as crowded as in like New York City. So, I mean, you're thinking of the Triangle Fire in New York. Uh, you know, th these are not, maybe four stories at the most of the factories. Uh, they do have fire escapes, but if you looked at the pictures I showed, not enough of them. It's clearly you couldn't get out everywhere. So I, I've not been able to find anyone who died in a fire, uh, in any of the factory fires in Willimantic. Uh, a lot more people got run over by trains, it seems, than died in the factory fires in, in Willimantic. But there were fires, and they were pretty serious, and some of them were very clearly arson. Um, as well, um, the, often the result of, of political battles within the town uh, as well. So lots of people injured, probably not too many people killed right away. But of course, brown lung will kill you eventually. Uh, but that wouldn't be recorded on the state documents. There's a question back there, Michael. So there's a question about the population in Willimantic. So. In, uh, these are gonna be rough numbers, and I'm talking off the top of my head, which is dangerous for me to try to do things from memory. Uh, but I think in, in the city of Willimantic, not the town of Wyndham as a whole, but in the city of Willimantic in 1910, I think the population is around 13,000. Um, so uh, it's not a huge place. So to, today, the whole town of Wyndham is 24,000. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not really big, although I grew up in rural Maine, so it seems big to me. Um, so that's the kind of population we're talking about. But if we went to the mill towns uh, in Connecticut, uh, a lot of them are about that size. That's, that's, that's what they, Meriden is bigger. Uh, Hartford, of course, is much bigger. Uh, Bridgeport is way bigger. Uh, and those are all factory communities as well. But then there are smaller ones that would be uh, less than 10,000, places like Plainfield, uh, Danielson, and, and smaller places like, like that. But that, that's where, but it's a population density much greater than in the rural areas. And so it's, it's clearly urban. It has urban problems. The, the fires actually in the cities destroy more than the fires in the factories because they jump from building to building. So you get professional fire departments professional police departments. And what Connecticut did is it allowed urban areas to form boroughs so that they could 
tax themselves because the farmers weren't going to vote a tax increase to protect people who lived in the city. Uh, so the boroughs, the urban areas could create taxes that only the people living in the borough had to, had to pay. Um, it was, it was actually, it was kind of an ingenious compromise because it allowed the boroughs to have fire departments and police departments and things, things like that. And that, that's very much a part of, of urbanization. It also meant that the, the urban areas had the high schools. That's where the high schools were mostly located uh, as well. And so most people think of industrialization as not leading to in increases in education, but it actually does. The, the education levels go up as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Other questions? Yes. That's right. I was surprised that the uh, textile industry was still in Connecticut in the uh, early 1900s. My daughter lives in Greenville, South Carolina, and I thought a lot of the textiles moved, processing and manufacturing moved south. So you asked me one of my favorite questions, because this is something I did a ton of research on a few years ago, and, and that's the sort of the dates uh, of when did the textile industry leave Connecticut and, and New England. And, and so it starts to leave shortly after the Civil War. And it, so, my students think, aha, freed slaves are the labor. And the answer is no. Uh, only white people were hired in the, in the fact. And that's a here, too. That's in Connecticut. Until 1960, only white people got hired in the textile factories. Non-whites couldn't, couldn't get a job there. Uh, and it certainly was true in the South. What they did is they caught the mountain people coming out of the Appalachian Mountains. They caught them as they're coming on out looking for work. And they ended up working in, in those factories in the South. And the Southern factories were better in that they had more advanced technology because they just had recently been built. So they have the steam engines and all that sort of stuff. They're all one-story buildings and things like that. They all have electric lights in them. They're closer to where the coal is so they can have the, the power for, for steam. So what happens is the decline of the New England textile industry began around 1880. That's what starts to begin. People notice it around 1920. In the 1920s, people are starting to talk about it in New England, people in Connecticut. And what they're saying is what you would expect. They say the factories are leaving. No, they can't possibly. That will never happen around here is the factories will never leave. But if they do, this is why. But they aren't. Uh, so it's, you know, people are in denial. You can't be in denial in the 1950s. By the 1950s, it is absolutely obvious, just as you say, they're going to the South. Uh, and, and so there's a huge movement uh, of industry to the South because of cheap labor. It's all about cheap labor. It isn't really about environmental protection laws. Those haven't been passed yet, so it has nothing really to do with those. Uh, and it's, it begins before unions are strong. So it's not that unions, because unions got raises, we've already begun this process when the unions were really weak in the textile industry. Uh, it's not like, not like the steel workers. Uh, you know, their unions were much stronger. Uh, the textile workers' unions were very, very, uh, very weak. Uh, but it's because, because the South has much lower wages, because the South really for a long time was like a third world country uh, in terms of, uh, of wages. So they're not going to California. They're not going to Illinois. They're not going to Michigan. They're not going out West because the wages there are the same as they are here in New England. They're, they're going to the South. It's the South that is different and had really low wages. And so there's this, this movement to the South. Uh, and so the American Thread Company, which is the big company that was in Willimantic, uh, first uh, created branch plants in um, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Tennessee, and Georgia. And then they consolidate in those southern plants, closing all their New England ones. They had several ones in New England. They were a big international conglomerate. Uh, and uh, today, there is no American Thread Company anymore. The American Thread has been bought out by Coates and Clark which uh, ironically started the company to begin with in the 1890s. Coates and Clark is a British conglomerate, and they started American Thread because they're trying to take over the American Thread industry uh, and create a monopoly, a and they did for a little while, and then the Woodrow Wilson administration figured out what they were up to and brought an anti-monopoly suit against them and stripped off American Thread, but it now belongs to Coates and Clark again. Uh, there is one factory named American Thread sort of left in the U.S. It's in North Carolina, Marion, North Carolina. I visited it. Uh, and it's called Coates American. So it's got the American part still written. It's the only one that still has that uh, written into it. But it is on American Thread Road. Uh, 
and and, uh, uh, and, and uh, so there's still some, some some aspects. And I got to talk to some really nice people in Marion who told me all the stories. It's the same stories people in Willimantic tell, except in a southern accent. And my, you know, yep, my grandfather worked at the thread. They would say. Uh, so it's a very similar kind of experience, but but you're right. There was this moving out a long time. And American Thread in Willimantic lasted until 1985, and that is very late. So you know, Cheney Brothers is gone by you know by the 1950s uh, as a company. Most of the textile industries, factories are, sh if they haven't shut back down by the 1950s, they're shutting down in the 1950s. There is one textile factory, real textile factory, left in Connecticut in Stafford Springs. It's American Woolen, uh, and I'm told, I don't know if this is true, but what, what I'm told is they survive as a, by, uh, with a niche market. They're making high-end fabrics for the New York market. That's what I'm told. I'm also told that uh, a very large percentage of their labor force is robots, uh, that they're very, very heavily automated. Uh, and if the textile industry, which now has left the South, you know, it's not there anymore, it's in Asia now, that if it comes back, and there are people who think it will come back to the US, it'll, it'll come back as what are called dark factories, because it's all robots, so you don't need to turn on the heat or the light. Uh, you know, it, so it's not jobs. If it comes back, it's, it's not jobs. We do have a little small other niche market in Connecticut, and those are the alpaca farms and, and things like that. They're really cool. Uh, and there's some people that raise their own sheep, but their factory is smaller than this room, you know, and then they just put it with one copy of each machine and they put things through. But that's a niche market that they, they've got. So they can afford to charge more because people will pay more because of how cool their products are. But, you know, if they, they're not going to be selling to Walmart or anything like that. Uh, it, 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 you couldn't buy it cheap enough to put it in Walmart. Michael, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I'm gonna go down in front right here. Um, thanks, I love this lecture. I was curious um, about when you were, you were talking about unions and strikes. When did, did the concept of workers uniting and um, um, saying unfair wages, did that develop out of the mills? Or was that before? Yeah. So the question is, do, do the mills and industrialization create the idea of unions and strikes and things like that? And the answer is yes and no. Uh, so there are, there's organization of strikes earlier. The first strike in what's now the United States was in colonial Jamestown uh, in the 1600s. And they brought in... I want to say German workers. I may be wrong about that, but they brought in, you know, a group like that and treated them badly. And they went on strike, uh, and they had to pay them more. Uh, but it was a small group of people. Uh, unions start to be organized early in the 1800s, though, in the U.S., and those do come out of industry because that's where you have enough workers in a workplace to be able to try to organize uh, a, a union, uh, and they're singularly unsuccessful at first. So one of the earliest strikes in America was in Lowell, in the textile factory up there, and Harriet Hanson Robinson sort of unwittingly helped lead it and started in her room. So she, she, she was a kid at the time. She was 12, something like that. So she got excited about it. So she, she led the, the strikers out of the building. And she didn't get fired, but her mother did. Her mother owned, uh, her mother didn't own, her mother ran a boarding house. She was a boarding house keeper. And so they fired the mother, said, you should have raised your kid better than that. You've lost your job. Uh, but your, your daughter didn't know better, so we'll keep her. Uh, so, you know, Harry, but you learn, and that strike failed miserably. I mean, it was easy to replace them. That most textile workers uh, were semi-skilled, and so it was easy to find replacements for them. You can train somebody to a basic level of skill within only a few weeks, uh, and so they, they would. Uh, so the more skilled the workers, like the tobacco rollers, were very highly skilled, so they had successful unions. Uh, but really until the 20th century, the industrial unions, the ones of unskilled workers, they lose when they have strikes. And there are a whole bunch of strikes in Connecticut at the textile factories and probably elsewhere too. And, and they, they, they all lose until 1912. And that's just simply because the market is too good to close down because Europe is launching towards World War I. 
And American businesses are thinking, those European factories are not going to be producing some of the stuff we produce real soon. We want to start gearing up for that. Uh, and so they, there are these very successful 1912 strikes. But then in 1925, after World War One's over, they roll back the wages uh, and the strikes are miserable failures. Uh, so Willimannock's worst strike was 1925 and the union is broken and it's gone for a decade. It just won't be around. Um, and, and finally reorganizes back really as a result of the Wagner Act in 1937, maybe, um, which sets up the current, uh, you know, collective bargaining that we have today. Uh, and that the, the union would be destroyed. It's really hard for textile workers because they're, they're semi-skilled workers to, to be successful. So uh, mostly the answer to your question is yes, we really do start to get unions out of, out, of, out of industry and industrialization. All right, well, Jamie, thank you so much again. Um, I wanna thank you for, for your wonderful presentation. I encourage all of you to join us for a reception. Um, there's some refreshments in the back. And um, I know Jamie will be around for a little bit longer if you have a quick question for him on his way out. But um, please enjoy the refreshments. And thank you so much for joining us here today. We hope to see you at the next lecture, uh, lecture in February. So thank you.